Okay, hello and welcome to episode 89 of the Market Maker podcast. And Piers is back. Hello. Look at that. Here. I mean, if you're watching this on video, so before we started this, I was trying to tweak my lighting. <laughs> and I was because we record this on, on Zoom, I was tweaking my lighting, trying to play with the webcam settings, because even though I'm half Chinese, which I guess I should have some sort of shade difference in skin color to you <laughs> being Caucasian, Pierce, you are significantly darker than I am right now because of this autumn or well, autumn winter tan that you're rocking yeah. these days. Where's your, where's your bronze filter? <laughs> That's what you need to be finding. You need to check that box if you want to <laughs> compete. Well, look, you know, while you've been away, there's been, um, you know, just a couple of things happening. Yeah. <laughs> Changing government. A, um, <laughs> a, a tech earnings bloodbath in some respects for some companies. Uh, I think, what was it? Amazon was down um, the day after the earnings in excess of 20 percent yeah it's 20 plus wasn't it yeah which is huge um obviously zuckerberg still yes. treading water at this point but yeah i just wondered when you were away did you get a chance to to catch any of those any thoughts well i did um you know keeping my ear to the ground obviously i also got uh, an email dropped into my inbox from a certain mr anthony chung oh. um listing out in fine detail um all, all of the numbers and the breakdown from the yeah the big the big tech guns so yeah thanks to you um but yeah i'm not gonna lie i was kind of sat on the sun manger just having a sneaky look you know <laughs> on the phone it's hard to uh it's hard to resist <laughs> so if you um if you were going to pick one though when you read that list that kind of jumped out to you was there any specific one well, um I guess probably Google. Um, I mean, look, Amazon, I know, got chopped in terms of share price reaction um, much more aggressively. But, you know, the nature of that business, even though their AWS side of things, of course, is, is the jewel in their crown and is the fastest growing part of their business and has been for years. Um, you know, of course, it's still not... Not there yet in terms of size compared to the big retail global retail kind of network so obviously amazon still is perhaps more vulnerable to a kind of macro headwind perspective and, and because also amazon run with much thinner margins uh, as a function of that kind of retail distribution kind of business model so i think with amazon still don't get me wrong i wasn't expecting such a bad report on the share price to drop 20 percent i mean certainly wasn't expecting that at all but yeah i think google um has been incredibly resilient i mean google of course a large part of their revenues is advertising and so you might think traditionally then that you know that is vulnerable as a revenue stream heading into a recession historically you know businesses tend to when they're looking to looking to trim costs to tighten the belt, then often the advertising budget is the easiest and the quickest thing to kind of turn off and on. Um, but Google's a bit different to uh, normal advertising or, or companies that generate revenue through advertising. Um, you know, it, it's less about here stick an ad on my platform, so. The people on my website can see it. Obviously, for Google, people are going, it's a destination for people to go to to very specifically search for something. And then so it's a, it's a slightly different, much more resilient sort of advertising revenue. And that's and they've been, you know, very resilient throughout this year so far yeah. and through the energy crisis and the inflation situation. So yeah. and they do segment out YouTube. Right outside of the Google core search business, yeah, to effectively manage what you're describing, right? And you know, YouTube was hit more than then that, that core kind of search side, of course. Um, but given their resilience this year, I wasn't wasn't expecting quite the uh, kind of negative report that we saw. So yeah, I think out of all of them, probably the Google one was the one that was like, wow, interesting, uh, mm -hmm. and actually a real kind of well, you know, a real kind of heads up to say, 
you know, whilst a lot of this data we're seeing is showing that the economy is resilient, actually, you're really genuinely now starting to see things turn. Um, and so, then just looking looking at the actual share prices, I mean, yeah. I was keeping an eye on them, obviously, in the aftermarket, but also conscious of zooming out and stepping back, as any investor would, to think, look, these tech giants, okay, Zuckerberg aside, these tech giants are here for the long haul. And so at what point is the pullback severe enough to, I guess yeah. the first destination would be technically, well, technicals aside is where were we prior to the pandemic and yeah. how much have we pulled back now? And I know there's a bit of a difference with these yeah. big names. And just before we talk about the individual big name share price moves, I just want to make another point. Um, like take an index like the S&P 500. And you take the big five tech firms, um, you know, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. Do I want to put Facebook in there anymore? I don't know. Let's, let's just keep them there. But I, I perhaps wouldn't include them for now. But um, point being, about 20 literally about 20 to 20 about 25 percent of the s p index was those five companies right it's crazy how big the giants have become and and how they dominate now in terms of market cap and you know on these massive indices but what this the story of this year i would say has been up until now it's been the smaller guys, generally speaking, have been hit quite badly. Talking about through quarter two, quarter three, through the summer. And so you've had some stocks, particularly on the tech side, small tech, and they're down like 70, 80% from their highs from the end of last year, right? So big, big, big cutbacks, all right? But during that quarter two, quarter three period, the big tech giants were resilient, they weren't coming off anywhere near as much, so they were staying strong. So net net, the index talking about the S and P, yes, did come down, but really only twenty percent, right? Even though a lot of those names below the big guns are off seventy eighty. What's happened in the last few weeks, or certainly last week, I think it's almost like the exact opposite, where now you've got the big guns have been chopped back, but actually all the other little guys underneath. They haven't come off. All right, there's been a lot of volatility, but, but actually they're quite relatively stable. So you've kind of had this opposite effect and net, net, the S&P, well, yeah, it has come down, but not by much, right? And we're certainly not, you know, the low of the year for the S&P is still mid-October. The S&P low of the year is at around 3,600 and we're right now trading 3,736. So whilst the, this kind of tech earnings pullback has been, um, you know, interesting. The whole index hasn't really suffered and we're still trading above the June lows, just about. So I think it's quite interesting. We've, we've now seen the big guns get pulled back whilst the, the, the majority of the smaller guys have stayed steady. I yeah. think this is quite an interesting sign. And, and as almost a segue into talking about the Fed, it was Mike Wilson, who's the chief US strategy for equities at Morgan Stanley, he was talking about, he's now saying that stocks could go up, I think he said to 4150. So this was a would, would be a 6% gain from last Friday's close, basically, or Friday's close. And he yeah. was talking about a short term bullish call. To put context on this, he's the biggest bear by <laughs> country mile yeah. on Wall Street. And the rationale he was putting there was about the end of Fed tightening is near. And a lot yeah. of that came from a journal article from one of these informed sources that was talking about the Fed are just about ready to pivot now and start stepping down the increments of 75 basis points. But now we're going to like reduce that and continue to do so going forward. We've hit peak. And that was why markets <laughs> before the Fed came out um, we were trading what back at nearly four thousand in the S and P, um, yeah, only a couple of days ago. Yeah, uh, but before we go into the Fed, tell, yeah, uh, so tell me about to... the the share prices though of these right. big tech giants. So, 
So, well, where do we start? I mean, let's just mention Facebook as a just, an, well, I was going to say an amusing side point. It's not amusing if you own share, shares in Facebook. It's the exact opposite. But I mean, obviously, this year has been just an absolute car crash, monster collapse in February, March, downward trending ever since then, and then our big nosedive um, last week, but net, net, down about 75% um, year on year. And just looking back longer term, Facebook shares are back to where they were trading summer of 2015 now. Um, and not, not far off, you know, a quarter of the, yeah, a quarter of the value of where they were sat, you know, this time last year. So obviously Facebook's a particularly extreme situation. Take Facebook out of it and take the other big four, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google. Well, Amazon first, I mean, trading below 90 now, so sub 90 bucks for an Amazon share. Um, and, you know, they're down about 48% year on year. So they're the next worst with regards to year on year figures. Amazon are now trading back. It's quite interesting. They were trading at 90 bucks back in 20, July 2018. Mm. So we've got Amazon now at a level we haven't seen for four and a half years. Um, giving back all of the pandemic, all of the pandemic bump. Um, so certainly if you're looking at which of the big four tech firms share prices are currently trading at the largest discount relative to all-time highs, then Amazon is that one. But you've got to think about they're not just four tech businesses. They're not just the same business often people just push them into this bucket and just massive tech but clearly they are very different businesses um and so as we've already said amazon's perhaps a little bit more vulnerable to like a macro downturn just from a retail point of view and they've got much thinner margins as i've already said so you know amazon's looking very attractive but could go could go further. I mean, it's hard to judge, isn't it? And we'll, I think, well, we'll perhaps talk about the kind of macro bit when we talk about the Fed. But um, yeah, so Amazon's 48% down year on year. Um, if you take the next worst, which I believe is actually Google, um, they're trading at 85 bucks. Well, I say Google, Alphabet Class A shares trading at $85. Um, and that's off a $150 high that we saw back um, 12 months ago. Um, so, yeah, they're back to levels um, seen at the end of 2020. So they haven't given back, like pre-COVID, they were trading at 60. So Google's still above that kind of pre-COVID levels. Um, Microsoft, year on year, down 35%. I mean, these are big numbers now, right? 35% and trading back to levels, yeah, since seen the summer of 2020. And then what's quite interesting, so those are big numbers. So, so Alf, uh, Amazon, 48% down. Google, I couldn't do the maths on that. Let's just say 40%. Microsoft, 35% year on year. Apple, seven. It's only down 7% year on year. So out of all of this, Apple are still, I guess, the biggest one from a market cap point of view. And actually, they're the last man standing, if you want to call it that in terms of avoiding, you know, monster um, kind of pullbacks. Um, and they're, they're trading, I mean, they're trading at levels we were seeing start of 2021. But I guess what, app, what happened to Apple was, which you've got to understand, is they didn't quite have the COVID explosion that these other businesses had. You know, Google and, and Amazon, of course, particularly had massive upside during COVID. Apple, not so much. So whilst they didn't bump so much in COVID, it makes sense they're not pulling back so much, you know, sort of post-COVID. So there is that to factor in. Um, but yeah, so out of all of them, from just a year-on-year -year share price point of view, then, um, you know, these big guns have finally, well, apart from Apple, perhaps, have finally turned and slumped. Um, the whole index hasn't gone with it, which for me is a pretty interesting kind of yeah. behavioral sign, because if... You wanted a reason for another big leg lower in these indexes. Then we had it last week, especially if you heap on top the hawkish Fed from yesterday. It's like if this thing wanted another big leg lower, the whole index, I mean, then it probably would 
this was the time and it hasn't happened. So I, yeah. for me, I think that's quite a powerful signal that maybe the bottom's in. Yeah, because the if you actually were to look at a chart of the S and P five hundred, the October um, kind of low is pretty much. I mean, we we hit thirty five hundred through a bout of volatility, um, and with even with the sell off that we've had in the last twenty four hours or so, still trading at thirty seven and a half. So, yeah, the Fed have come out; they've yeah. been quite clear. And we can just discuss this now, I guess, about their intention that, look, there's more pain to come. We've got to continue tightening and stocks have reacted negatively. But you're right. The big forces here from a top level perspective down have come out and are clear from the bottom going from a micro level. They've come out. And as you said, the biggest influential factors on these indices have come clean. And yet here we are, we're not smashing down through 35. We're far from it. Yeah. 250 points off it. Yeah. What else needs to happen? <laughs> well, exactly. Um, I mean, midterms come out, but that's not going to shift the needle in that way. And if anything, history would tell us <laughs> that actually indices tend to perform better because they come out of it, at least with, again, clarification of what the latest status is. And right. so you remove the uncertainties um, away from the table. So, yeah, it's yeah. definitely interesting right now. I think with the Fed, so, look, yeah, I mean, your, your man, at, um, your suit Uber bear at Morgan Stanley, who's turned bullish, you know, he was hoping, like uh, I think probably the majority, that the Fed would come out, hike 75 basis points again for the fourth meeting in a row, but then signal, look, we're going to take the foot off the accelerator. Not, we're not going to stop hiking, but we're going to start to hike at smaller increments with potentially the last hike being maybe in December, right? But the, the kind of flip card that Powell slipped in there last night to turn the whole thing on its head was, yes, he kind of fulfilled that expectation but then he added but we expect the terminal rate to be higher than is currently being priced and what was being priced was 4.6 percent right so if rates are at four percent now you you could have said 150 basis point hike in december maybe slide in a 25 hike in sort of end of january and then done right finishing around about four and a half to four point seven five percent but now markets are pricing, they're going to have to break 5%. So that terminal rate is the peak of the hiking cycle. And basically Powell said last night, look, guys, it might be as high as five, if not more. I mean, he didn't say the number precisely like that, but that's what markets are interpreting. So, yeah, just that higher peak in the hiking cycle was that curveball last night that just took the – because the S&P rallied 1% initially – off the back of Powell saying, look, we've gone 75 today. Most likely it's going to be 50 in December. We're going to start to slow down. Bang, big upside, 1%. Then he said, but look, guys, the terminal rate's going to be higher. And it all flipped, and the S&P finished down 2.6% on the day. Mm. Um, and then the, one of the other points that he made, which kind of then starts to link in the Bank of England, said policy needs to be more restrictive and that narrows the path to a soft landing. Yeah. Because one of the things the Bank of England was saying, who came out earlier today, we were recording this on Thursday, um, they talked about, they now believe the economy, the British economy, has already entered a challenging downturn this summer. That will continue next year and into the first half of 2024. Um, that will not be the UK's deepest downturn ever but it does date back to i think it's the 1920s uh, so yes. it goes back to the longest since records begun in the 1920s so the biggest downturn in history but certainly since records began so there's a challenging hugely challenging period ahead and one of the things i thought was interesting there was that it leads us into the next election and so rishi's come in we're about to be sat in a recession for his entire period. It's not like when Obama came in. You remember 
when yep, 2009, Obama came in, stocks January. got smashed between him winning the ele- election. I remember in three months, I think the S&P fell like 30% or something ridiculous because yep. he, he was coming in on the back of the previous administration, central bank decisions that had taken place. He came in and obviously rates got slashed and everything happened and stock market bounced back. He'll take credit for that, of course. <laughs> um, Rishi, um, we're in a completely different cycle where you can't... It, it, the whole reason for the powerful Obama bump when he came in was because none of the creative stuff and in the policy easing sense was really deployed until that point. We've already gone through all of that post-COVID. <laughs> you can't really go into that because we've got an inflation problem. I mean... Rishi, <laughs> to say well, he's got his work cut out. Yeah, talking about you know setting, you know conservative um, prime ministers setting you know all time worst ever records, uh, like Truss, shortest person in office ever. Well, yeah, it could well be Rishi sets a record where yeah. his uh, the economy worst performing economic conditions you know, under uh, any tenure of a prime minister ever kind of thing. But I like going back to the Bank of England, on the one hand, they did exactly the same thing as the Fed. On the other hand, their message was the exact opposite. So they both hiked 75 basis points. Okay. But the bank, so, and, and the Fed said, hiking 75, the, the terminal rate, the, the peak, in the hiking cycle, though, is going to be higher. It's going to have to be higher than markets are currently expecting. That was the Fed. The Bank of England hiked 75 basis points and said, you know what? We're probably going to stop here. Secondly, the peak in the interest rate hiking cycle is actually going to be lower than what markets are currently expecting. Mm. Super dovish. So the Fed did a hawkish 75 hike and the Bank of England did a dovish 75 hike by the language they use about what's coming next and further down the track. And some Mm. of the stuff, the Bank of England, I mean, they basically came out with two scenarios from an economic sort of, um, let's just say, forecasting point of view. One was like doomsday worst case, which, so this this was it. They said interest rates would, would have to rise to 5.25%. So bearing in mind, they've just hiked to 3%, okay? So doomsday is like, it's going to have to, inflation carries on being a much bigger problem than, than we currently think. Um, it's Rates got to 5.25%, and we enter into a recession um, that lasts for eight quarters. So as you were alluding to earlier, like the worst recession for like a century, eight quarters? I mean, that's just unimaginably bad. Um, Their positive scenario was, and this is their main theme, if this is the peak for inflation, it's going to peak in quarter four. We don't need to raise rates anymore. 3%, this is the top. Um, And if they're right, then fine. Inflation drops back down. I think they said 5.6% inflation by the end of 2023, 2.2% by the end of 2024. And it all just slowly kind of comes back down and rates don't have to go above 3%. In that scenario, though, they're still predicting five quarters of contraction. I mean, that's crazy length of time. Even that is just crazy for how long a recession might last. Normally, recessions last like nine months max. Um, so even their positive scenario is pretty ugly. But I think one thing also, because of all the mortgage debacle from the mini budget, obviously from a sort of people out there on the street point of view, freaking out, panicking, you know, there's 2 million mortgages that are up for, um, you know, expiring or the deals are expiring in the next 12 months, 2 million mortgages. And so people are freaking out quite rightly about, wow, I'm going to have to, rearrange my mortgage at an interest rate that's way north of what I've been used to. And it's going to cost me, I think on the, on an average mortgage, 130,000 a year. If you rearrange your mortgage now, Mm. you'd be paying 3000 pounds a year more in interest payments 
that's a lot of money. Um, and so people are quite rightly freaking out. So one clear message from the Bank of England yes, or today was rates aren't going to go above 3%. We're here. We're done. Inflation's going to peak. It's going to come back down, basically sending a message to the banks, mm. the mortgage rate setters, and the people out on the street that, look, that this big spike you've just seen in these mortgage rates, you're not going to have to rearrange your mortgage at this spike. It's all going to come back down, don't panic, was yeah. their kind of underlying message. I mean, there, there's one uh, there's one key assumption that you're making there, which is that Rishi Sunak is fiscally prudent and yeah. that he will have learned from the lesson of what just happened. All of these forecasts from the Bank of England are from mid-October. This is pre-Rishi pivot as in Rishi's kind of plan is obviously much less inflationary and some might argue deflationary, right, compared to Truss's super uber inflationary thing, right? So when the Bank of England say they think inflation is going to peak in quarter four and then it's going to start to come down, that's even before the Rishi effect, which should make that even more likely to happen. Hmm. Yeah, so... Yeah, it was just about the idea of if you're looking to guide certainty yeah. into the market and you're releasing economic forecasts without the government actually having decided anything really at this point. Right. Well, then what good are these forecasts? Yeah, that's fair. At this present moment in time. So that's fair. Um, I just think that the, that's <laughs> it's actually going to be they're, they're going to be subject to change, is all I'm but saying. The, yeah, but my point still stands. The direction of travel mm. from a fiscal point of view now under Sunak is not in, is not not should not contribute to the inflation problem. Mm. Right? Yep. So. Okay. Well, looking at the pound, I just had up, the chart up. Talking of uh, reversals from where we started yeah um i think the the rishi honeymoon's over <laughs> um we're trading just under 112 handle at the moment to sterling but well yeah his trust low was obviously way lower at 104 it is but look there's a lot of uk political volatility in that sterling dollar chart in the last month step back then it's been trending lower. I mean, you could if you want to. Well, if you want to go all the way back. It's been trending lower for like fifteen years. But um, I think now the political noise is gone. Then you're still left with this scenario that a the Fed are more hawkish than the Bank of England. That has just been absolutely clearly reconfirmed in the last twenty four hours. Okay, so the Fed are way more hawkish. That should lead to sterling devaluing against the dollar secondly the uk recession is going to be a lot worse and probably a lot longer than the us recession so probably the economic divergence should also lead to the currency exchange rate continue to go down so i think whilst the noise on the political side in the uk has perhaps been put to bed don't now think oh rishi's here great sterling's now going to rally back to 120 no the big giant macro forces, I believe, mm. are actually still probably suggesting the exchange rate goes lower, back below 110. Yep. Don't disagree. Yeah. And then finally, to round things off just quickly, we'll see if we can keep it to five or so minutes. <laughs> um, but it's happened. And Elon Musk has taken control of, of Twitter. There's been lots of tweets as you can imagine, um, I even passed comment about some of the activities that have been going on as far as since he's come in, which from a top level, announcing plans for a premium $8 a month subscription service. Now, I was going to ask you about this before you, before you go on. Because so I was going to ask you, hmm. you, know, are you, how do you feel about paying 8 bucks a month? As, just assuming that you were a blue tick guy but then i went on twitter and, and you're not 
Where's your blue tick? <laughs> Obviously not quite important important enough. How'd you get how'd you get a blue tick? So before there used to be a process where you'd have to submit it would be the same on Facebook for Instagram as it would really for Twitter. Yeah. You need to be in a category of some influence. So a politician, a sports person, a music person, and you need supplementary material to suggest of your influence. So right. an article in a major publication, so on and okay. so forth, or a volume of following on a certain platform with, to authenticate. And this is the key for me of why this model doesn't work. Yeah. It's because I know that certain political circles will say, well, freedom of speech everyone can pay and the problem they have is about who is actually setting out the parameters for who gets selected is their key problem with the way it used to be done right my problem is if you give everyone access to having a blue tick which obviously still equates to a previous anchoring psychologically of someone of relevance that what they're saying has been fact checked and verified and is authentic now any man and his dog can have right. that ability and i know this is the opposite view because his thing is about freedom of speech but i feel like the problem is going to be exacerbated because misinformation will spread far easier through issuing an ability to have a low barrier to getting verified yeah. And actually there was a, there was some research I saw about I think if you were to convert all of the current verified users of Twitter into an $8 sub. Yeah. I think it equates to something like $50 million. Well, I think it's well I I like heard that. I heard that there's hundreds of thousands of Twitter users that have been verified. So we're only hundreds of thousands so i just plucked a number let's assume that's five hundred thousand. that's four million dollars a month so 48 million dollars a year which yeah. for a company the size of twitter strikes me as not moving right. the needle particularly yeah, so i've got i've got much. the numbers here so if every single currently verified user signed up to pay but no others yeah that would be worth 40 million dollars a year right yeah right okay. so, so it's less than 500,000 if yeah. the company successfully convinced 10 percent of its 229 million active users to pay the proposed eight bucks a month charge they would generate circa two billion right dollars in revenue um yeah. that's a substantial sum obviously but it's still less than half of what they make in just standard ad revenue advertising but that's contingent they've got to flip 10 percent yeah of their well, active there was a, users there was a big poll done by jason calcanis um he did a poll on his twitter handle and that, he had 1.2 million respondents so a pr very insightful the sample size is huge and the results and he he asked what you know would you pay he actually said would you pay five dollars a month um uh and 80 percent uh said they would not 80 so then 11 percent. sorry hang on 80 percent said they wouldn't pay anything they're not prepared to pay anything 11 percent said they'd pay five bucks 5.5 percent said they'd pay 15 bucks so yeah look uh, obviously Obviously, Elon's going to try a whole bunch of stuff here to kind of try and turn this thing around. And uh, obviously, on the cost cutting side of things as well, but from a kind of, you know, more further revenue streams. Yeah, this this first one he's going at pretty hard by the sounds of it. He's getting the developers working yeah, through so the he's night. Pulled, he's pulled engineers from Tesla, from Tesla. I don't know how that makes yeah. me feel if I were a Tesla shareholder. Well, <laughs> this is it, isn't it? You've got such a weird scenario, isn't it? That you've got two companies that are not related in any way whatsoever in terms of the businesses that they are. And yet 
you've got this weird scenario where you've got a dictator sat at the top of the tree and can pluck people from one to the other. And it, yeah, now from a shareholder point of view, holding Tesla shares, you're like, hang on a minute. How that I done, you know, I didn't sign up for this. Um, and so it will be very interesting to see what happens to that Tesla stock in the weeks to come as mm. Elon messes about with his new toy. Yeah, it's interesting because I mean Tesla hasn't really moved a great deal. Yeah. It does make me um one thing is I, I passed judgment of what I thought about Elon's latest moves and uh, my LinkedIn got attacked <laughs> by the Elon Easters <laughs> who've come out in force to put me in my place. Yeah. And it's such an interesting um, situation because the, the common theme in their posts is similar to the atmosphere that surrounded the GameStop situation whereby a lot of people are saying what's so different between what a private equity firm does as to what Elon is doing other than he's a public figure and talks about it. It's always, it seems to cut at the core at this philosophy of there's us, the people of which Elon represents, and then yeah. there's the suits who've been robbing people since the beginning of time. And it well, makes I'm people very yeah. angry and that when i look at tesla's share price and it hasn't moved yeah when to me from a governance from a right. general that's the word right, governance from a, that's from why that, it's different from that perspective i i do find it incredibly hard to see how you can manage multiple one being a trillion dollar business in a leadership style which is very much dependent on a singular individual because, I mean, he has sacked the entire management team pretty much yeah. of Twitter straight yeah. off the bat. And the whole board. Um, so, yeah, I, I wonder how in the long term, I, I, I think short what? term, I think it's remiss to think that Tesla would have a negative impact. But I think as he goes on, and my, one of my concerns about him as a, as a business owner or operator is that I feel he's very ambitious so he's not going to stop and go reverse and think, actually, I better just see to it and improve and make sure what I have is firing. He's going to accumulate more and more. Twitter's the current fascination. <laughs> He'll move on to the next thing. Well, And then at it, some point, literally, metaphorically, the wheels will come off. Here's a counter argument. It could be good for Tesla. Because, look, there's four companies now, right? that he's got Tesla, SpaceX, The Boring, which is his tunnel boring company, which isn't obviously anywhere near as big as the others, and then and then Twitter, right? But it could be that these are massive companies. We've argued on this podcast in the past that Elon should step away from Tesla. It's too big now. It's too mature. Let's get a proper team in to, you know, got experience in running a multinational, you know, publicly listed business and do it properly. And so... Maybe this is Elon now stepping away from Tesla and, and now concentrating on this new toy, which is Twitter. So who knows? Maybe, maybe governance can now improve. At well, Tesla. so if you, the problem you have there, I think, as another counter argument, is that he walks away. But that current stock price, the reason yeah. why I'm saying it's not moving at the moment because of what's happening, is because of the type of shareholder who buys. A Tesla yeah. stock. Yeah, yeah. Now the rest of the EV pack will surpass Tesla. It's not, I don't think, question of if, but when. Yeah. Then it comes down to the pure fundamentals of that company, which are not sufficient. <laughs> and so at that point, then the kind of pump around that as a brand that helps keep it elevated. When you then start comparing it to a company that is no longer market leading, I think then, and that's a medium term play, it comes home to roost. Your um, your LinkedIn's going to blow up again. <laughs> yeah, that, that I mean it's brilliant as well because you know I put forward my um, my point of view, and then people <laughs> say I'm. I'm anti-free speech, but I thought giving my point of view, I thought was free speech. Uh, 
Oh, that's funny. But the obviously irony I can't, of that I can't, comment. I obviously can't criticize the guy because that wouldn't be <laughs> fair in free speech. But um, there we have it. Anyhow, we'll wrap it up there. Um, thanks, Piers, and uh, good to have you back. And yeah, as always, if you enjoyed the episode, feel free to give it a rating and uh, pass judgment in the review. We'd really appreciate it. It helps uh, get this out to as many people as possible. But enjoy your weekend and see you for next week's episode. Yep. Catch you later.